You're listening to the Native Plants Healthy Planet Podcast, presented by Pinelands Nursery. Here are your hosts, Fran Chismar and Tom Knezic. Welcome back to The Buzz, brought to you by the Native Plants Healthy Planet podcast, presented by Pinelands Nursery. I am Fran Chismar. And I'm Tom Knezic, and welcome to episode 45. And uh, if you've been paying attention the last couple episodes, I kind of like to throw a joke in here. You have been. And I took to the internet because I couldn't think of a good, like, shrub-related pun to start this episode with, and uh, I was uh, amazed oh, <laughs> at what the internet had, uh, had for uh, me today. So I'm going to throw out a couple. Oh, no. So um, Because, I'm, well, our... Our buzz episode today is based. That's, on, we're we're continuing <laughs> our theme. We've done uh, Forbes and graminoids. To, so today, as promised, we're focusing on shrubs. So are yeah. they shrub, shrub? Which is in in my mind, shrubs are like an overlooked. Uh, everyone thinks about trees and they yeah. think about the flowers. Grasses are even overlooked, but the shrubs to me are like probably the over, most overlooked category. The understory is really important. Yeah, and and we talk about that all the time with yeah. the health of our forest, with the lack of understory. That that's it's really important for songbirds and things yeah. like that. So but, right. yeah, but when I was looking up puns, the internet delivered, and I couldn't choose just one. Oh no! So, <laughs> all so, right. <laughs> so, so, so Fran, I've been setting some money aside to buy some new shrubs for out front. Yeah, I call it my hedge fund. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. That's <laughs> I'm a dad now. I can make these kind of jokes. <laughs> a plant is fine, a shrub is fine, but trees a crowd. Oh, Ooh, that was oh, <laughs> pretty. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what do you call a shrub that's growing underwater? A what? A shrub marine. <laughs> That might be enough. I'll... You know, I, I I wish I had. I I don't have the sound effect. I wish I had like a hi hat sound effect. Like <laughs> yeah, that would have been perfect. Right I, I I was looking. I was like, do I have that sound effect? I'm adding it. Uh maybe maybe this is a trend we shouldn't continue. Yeah. <laughs> maybe. I was just shocked that that was. I thought, oh, yeah, good luck finding some kind of play on words with around shrubs, but. There's oh, some yeah. shrub joke enthusiasts out wow. there. Wow. It's, uh, it's wow. pretty amazing. We do know some tree jokes, but they're not necessarily appropriate for yeah. the podcast. <laughs> so that's it. <laughs> we'll, we'll a little, save little nurseryman another. humor. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll save those for another time. So even though this this uh, this episode is airing on a Friday, we're recording it on a Wednesday, and today St. Patrick's Day. Yeah. So happy St. Patrick's yeah. Day. Shamrocks, uh, not a shrub. Uh, I, am, oh. I am getting a shamrock shake, though, today. Yeah. Because, and I found out that through my recent ancestry uh, uh, DNA test, that I'm 11% Irish. I had no clue at all. Oh wow, no clue yeah. at all. So I can celebrate. I can legitimately celebrate St. Yeah. Patrick's Day. Yeah, at least 11% of me. I don't know. If, no, if we're doing anything for like our St. Patrick's Day. I remember growing up, we had uh, what's the corned beef and cabbage, yeah. but which then you find out that's not even an Irish, Irish. thing. That was like when the Irish came to New York City and. We're living in the same neighborhoods as the Jewish people. The Jewish people had brisket, and yep. that's how corned beef came about. Yep. But uh, one of the things I've actually started to do the last couple of years is make corned venison. Oh. And um, I'll go through the whole corning process. Surprisingly easy. It's really just salt okay. and uh, sodium nitrate, which is great for you. That's <laughs> really good to put it <laughs> in your body. It makes that the meat that like lovely shade of pink. Wow. But um, and some pickling spices, a little bit of sugar, and you just soak it in for a week and we're gonna we're not having it tonight we're gonna no. have it on on okay. sunday gotcha but uh i got a late start i'm but. not really focusing on the food i'm focusing more on the whiskey i think yeah, That's, <laughs> yeah. yeah although, you're gonna spike your shake, shake we, a little bit we did focus on food so one of our co-workers brought in <laughs> cupcakes with with green icing but also mm -hmm. instead of rice crispy treat they were lucky charms treat which with extra marshmallow i don't know if you had yeah those. yeah i i like them yeah but i heard you can complaining i don't know if you're I'm saving not that for your, complain. your, no. your complaint no, later I, on. I didn't i didn't dislike them it just wasn't it didn't blow me away but yeah. i'm not really like a breakfast cereal i am a sugar freak and i do have a sweet tooth but for some reason i don't i'm not a big fan of breakfast cereals yeah. so, so so but i had way too much to eat today yeah <laughs> so but, i'm already slowed down <laughs> but we are we got some questions this week so we know we it's probably questions. gonna be a, a long episode because uh we did have our long-winded 
friend that called in as well. We, so yes. But you're yes. gonna have to wait for that. We want to kick off this episode like we kick off every episode with that's hot. That's hot. So would you like to go first? Would you I don't even know what yours is, but I'll, I'll go first. Okay, um, great. That gives me an opportunity to actually change. And my this background. is we're we're like I've been complaining in the last couple uh, episodes of the buzz. We were running out of plants over the winter and we're finally starting to come out of that. And uh, it's actually one of my favorite shrubs that I'm featuring today, and that is Salix Discolor. Oh, very and nice. And that is uh, the Pussy Willow, really... and it's really just starting to bloom right now. I was talking to my brother, and um, he was saying in our area uh, of, of central New Jersey, probably like one or two more hot days, and they'll really start to open yeah. up and flower. And if you aren't familiar with that plant, it's um, it's in the Willow family. Uh, it likes it fairly wet. It's a facultative wet plant. Uh, it'll grow... Well, when it's multi-stemmed, it'll grow 15 feet tall, yeah. roughly. Yeah, um, it can be shorter than that. You can prune it pretty heavily, and it'll yeah. keep branching out. I consider that a shrub. I don't know its actual classification. I but consider a small a, tree a or shrub a large too, shrub. But yeah. I grew one. This is I think I've even told this story. It was the first plant I ever really grew, and it was just a stick I found on the ground. I stuck it in a pot of sand, and it grew. And we ended up planting it uh, behind our house, and it grew. It was a single stem. Okay. Uh, pussy well, it grew about 30 feet tall. It was as tall as the house. Wow. And uh, it was huge. That's but awesome. It, I've actually looked that up and they said that's fairly rare to have that kind of growth habit. Most of the time right. they're multi stemmed, they stay short. Yeah. Not, I don't want to say short, yeah. but they don't get 30 feet tall together. Right. And 10 for, to 15 feet tall. And for our listeners that are thinking about doing them live stakes, so like <clears> you can actually put them in a, in a glass of cutting in a glass of water yeah. and it will root, but you mm -hmm. can also. Uh, take a cutting, put it right in the ground. It will root. And if you if it's coming up single stem and not shrubby, you can just cut it back really mm -hmm. hard, and it will force it to be a multi stem. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, some other things I found out. I I knew the the fuzzy. If you're familiar with that plant, it gets a a fuzzy flower. I guess yeah. is, is technically like a catkin. Uh, but yeah, they're technically called catkins, catkins, which is where it gets the name pussy willow. Yeah. Um, and I didn't realize that they were dioecious until I was just started looking them up today. You know what? I, I didn't know that either. And uh, there's male flowers, which the male flowers are the ones that are more prized in the ornamental trade. You'll find yeah. them actually a lot now in uh, in bouquets and, yeah. um, and arrangements of that sort. But uh, And the female flowers are smaller and a little bit greener where the male flowers are bigger mm -hmm. and, and more gold. Which, uh, which I didn't know that until I just looked it up. No. And being in the Willow family, uh, if you look at, refer to Doug Tallamy's list, that's pretty high on um, uh, for uh, ben being beneficial for Lepidoptera species and yeah. butterfly species, moth species. And uh, and and there are uh, bee specialists, Willow, yeah. Willow bee specialists. And uh, Pussy Willow in particular is really good for the Viceroy butterfly larvae, wow. which I found out. So for our listeners that maybe don't understand what dioecious is, so... And I, I, I'll be yeah, honest. I should have done a better job. Even, explaining even that. as a nurseryman, I <clears throat> confuse. I know the concept, but I constantly confuse it. So there's monoecious and dioecious. Mm -hmm. Dioecious means there's a male and female plant. Yes. You need one yeah. of each to get uh, berries or fruit. Mm -hmm. or, where monoecious, mm -hmm. it's male and female on the same, on plant, the same plant, and it, you don't need. Sometimes you confuse because it's like. Does monoecious mean there's only one? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, but yeah. it's yeah, monoecious means there's. And then at this, uh, yeah. to complicate things further when it comes to to plant um, breeding and yeah. and all that is sometimes you have plants where that plant can um, fertilize itself, and mm -hmm. sometimes you have plants where they need other plants. Right. Think of pawpaws. Pawpaws, yeah. uh, you need. Um, two separate plants or even blueberries yeah. i believe you need yeah. two separate plants to fertilize each other yes. that plant a bee couldn't visit one flower on that plant and fertilize another flower on that same plant it needs yeah. to go to another plant to fertilize it yes uh one the of the same way i think persimmon may be that way too i, I think i believe it yeah. is i know one of the misconceptions is um uh i've had this question with pawpaw in particular is people say oh well, i need a, a different variety i can't get the same pawpaw which is true if you're getting varieties of pawpaw yeah. When it's a straight species, you just need two plants. If you, you need, just, yes. If you are getting a variety of pawpaw, which I don't even remember variety names of pawpaw, mm -hmm. uh, you would need a uh, two different varieties because yes. if you had two separate plants and they're the same variety, technically they are genetically identical. So that's yeah. why they can't they can't do it. Pro even though they're two separate plants, they can't propagate each other because they're because you clone them. the same. Yeah, they're they're exactly so, the same. So. Yeah, um, Oh, already, we're choice. already deviating. <laughs> 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 uh, 
<laughs> so mine is, you know, and it's again, it's it's funny, you know, it's it's getting towards the end of winter. It's 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 you know close to the beginning of spring, but and you you think, wow, there's there's not a lot of winter interest, or we've covered it all, and then you come across something that you forget about. And mine was Rose of Virginiana mm-hmm. or uh, Virginia Rose. Um, you know, I had to pick a shrub since we were doing shrubs. Mm-hmm. I thought that would be a great one, but it's a, a facultative species. Four to six foot tall. It has a single pink solitary flower. Uh, it can take wet. It can take dry. I've seen it a lot of times in more coastal environments, uh, mm-hmm. and and birds like it. So cardinals and bluebirds really like the rose hip. So it does have a very attractive rose hip uh, for winter interest and for for birds for foraging. So. You know, and I just happened to walk by uh, one and saw the rose hips. I was like, yeah, you know, it's it's funny what you overlook sometimes and forget about. But that is my uh, that is my my that's hot. Now, is the Virginia rose or those rose hips edible to humans? I don't know. I, uh, I honestly don't know. And I, I I'm I'm it, I, it, yes, they well. I think that, <laughs> yeah, okay. I'm pretty sure. Do your own research at home just yes. to double check, but I believe those ones are edible to humans as well. Okay. Yeah. I'm um, not, I'm not positive. But, so yeah, awesome. Very cool. Awesome. So let's, we should probably move on. So, oh yeah. yeah. Um, and this is our botany based current <laughs> events that, that we always do. So, uh, and of gonna, course it's gotta be a competition. It is always a competition. You can get with this, or you can get with that. So the winner of, of this and that this week i i don't even know who won it, it's a tie we tie technically it's a tie six six but <laughs> this, this is my complaint I'm, I'm combining two segments here all right so on in the facebook group it's six six but I kind of feel there has to be some sort of role when you enter a contest, like say you hear something on the radio and they ask you to call in or <laughs> I think I know where it, you're going. It's <laughs> always that uh, family and coworkers aren't, you know, they can't, they can't participate. Mm-hmm. So the, the tying vote was your wife. And I didn't and, request that. No, and she, and I'm and not she saying doesn't always vote for me. She, oh, she I asked she's her to, never, but, she, vo- <laughs> but, but, there's been times with your your mom and your wife have voted, but they've never voted for me. So I'd have to say that <laughs> yeah, they, they do vote. Voted. They may not vote every week, but when they vote, they vote for you. So I kind of feel there is a bias there, and maybe it shouldn't be allowable. That's my that's I, my I thought. disagree. Simply oh. because I'll, I'll lose. <laughs> I just feel right now it's a tie. I kind of feel like like Melissa's vote should not be allowed. Now, the wonderful thing is I know Melissa's going to listen to this before it actually airs. Yeah. So she'll hear this conversation. Oh, yeah. And then, yeah, I wish we could call her and then have her chime in. But, uh, you know, what? But I don't know if she'll <laughs> she'll answer. You know what? You want me to call her? Yeah, let's do it. All right. All right. Hold on. Let me let me try yeah. this. This may work. This may not. All right. We got a nine month baby at home. So who knows? She's she may, doing see, right she now. may see that it's me. Like, why is <laughs> yeah. Fran calling me? We've never done this live phone call. Hello. Hi, Melissa. It's Fran. And I just want to let you know you're on the air on the podcast right now with Tom and I. Oh. <laughs> so. There's a reason why I'm calling. We're we're discussing. We're at the the segment where we discuss this or that and the score, and who uh-huh. won for the week. So, right now it's a tie. Technically, it's oh a tie. But uh-huh. I am arguing the fact that you should not be allowed to vote. <laughs> well, okay, because I have a bias. Because <laughs> yeah, because your family, okay. and that I, even though Tom doesn't ask you to vote or vote for him. You've never voted for me. So one, I'm hurt. Wow. <laughs> Fran, you're noticing these details. I am. I have an eagle eye when it comes to rules. So we're Fran, trying. I can't help that you don't pick the good articles. Fran. Oh, I can't help that. Oh, oh. You know, I'm, I'm thinking Melissa should also be banned from the, <laughs> the Native Plan wow. Healthy Planet Facebook group. <laughs> Blacklisted. <laughs> Blacklisted. I don't know. What are your feelings on this? Uh, you know, if, if you could promise me that somewhere in the future you will vote for one of my articles, 
I don't have I a could problem throw you with a it. Pity vote. I could try <laughs> to do that. You know, I'm. Tr I'm. Yeah, maybe on I'm one of those. Follower myself. <laughs> yeah, those instances where you're losing like 15 to one. Maybe, <laughs> right. maybe she can throw you a vote then. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Like when I'm when I have no chance of winning, she'll be like, eh, I could throw one friend's way. I don't know. Yeah, but What's, you know, if I do that, you're going to feel like it's not genuine now. When when I vote for you, you're going to be like, oh, is this a pity vote? Is this a real <laughs> vote? I don't know. Can I trust her? It's a little sus. Tom, is that something I would do? <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know if it's you would. It's totally yeah, something it's I would do. Agonizing over it. <laughs> it's totally something I would do. Uh, all right, I'm going to I'm going to make a ruling. I'm going to allow it this time. But if I, I if I see a vote. pattern, uh -huh. I, I think I would. Uh, this is also my not that I'm one to complain segment as well. Okay. Uh, where I'm complaining, so. We figured we needed to call and, and get a clarification. I just wanted to make sure it wasn't biased. Okay. I promise to vote with my heart and not my last name. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Thank you for, for being a part of the uh, podcast today. Of course. Anytime. <laughs> Good talking to you. Right, talk to you later. <laughs> bye, guys. All right. Bye. <laughs> All right. There you go. Yeah, This may be one of the few instances where there is not only one. Yeah, I can't even play that. Yeah. There's not only one. So it was a tie, So which was good, and we had 12 votes. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny. Some weeks we get a lot of votes. Some weeks yeah, yeah. no votes. I don't know if it's just that people didn't listen that week or if they don't really care. Or I, can't I do think it's some, some of it's when I put up the Facebook post a little late. late. When we're, but, you know, yeah, yeah, I think when it comes up, you know, it's it's hard because we're sometimes the buzz isn't always recorded the week that it airs sometimes mm -hmm. we have to do it early sometimes we don't have enough votes yeah. in when we do it but it's what we have yeah. and we have to deal with it we're starting to get pretty busy around here so we're getting to the yeah. point where i think we're going to start doing some episodes back to back just out of necessity mm -hmm. so yeah it may be you know the vote could change that's one thing that we haven't like we haven't gone back to look and see people because mm -hmm. yeah that is what uh, we're recording this on st patrick's day yeah. but what if the person's listening in august yeah then what exactly they can't they can't take part but that's on them they should be listening yeah, live listen now this because this is going to come out yeah. you need to listen and then go right over the facebook group and vote uh we can't we can't make any exceptions <laughs> from now on no votes over youtube We're <laughs> yeah it's 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 now or never so yeah. all right well, well given that it, it's a draw we, would you yeah. like to, i i, I don't think we did have two uniquely interesting articles i do too. too i and, do too. uh and I think we do this week as well. Yeah. So, and and it's, would you like to go first? Yeah, I'll go first. Okay. All right. So this was... Uh, and, and you had trouble choosing articles. I did, week. yeah. And um, I like I, I've mentioned before, I go through LinkedIn, Facebook, whatever I'm on, I, I'll see an article. Even though I'm just reading, I'll see an article that kind of fits where I think, oh, maybe this will be a good one that'll get a lot of votes or or it's just interesting yeah. to me. I'll put it in my... Um, my, uh, my safari browser and just kind of leave the tab yeah. open and yeah and um and i'll come back to them later and then say okay which one's going to be the best and i was really torn between three one of which was like okay this is going to get me votes yeah. i know it will it was pretty simple it's pretty basic but i wasn't as interested in it i shouldn't say that i was interested in it. it was all about why you should start gardening later because um it's you have a lot of butterflies and and moths that have eggs that are in your in your leaves and in your or <clears throat> bees in the stems like of plants like we talked about last week yeah. and you don't want to clean that up too soon because then you're basically disposing of all that yeah. stuff yeah. as well uh i mean preferably you, if you can you don't want to clean yeah. it up at all but you know i know that that's difficult sometimes mm -hmm. and and you you, you yeah. do the best you can. and that is something i do want to make sure we we put out in the podcast as well if you're thinking like now we just had a couple warm days and the last week uh, the weekend was pretty nice. A lot of people were itching to get out of your, your, their gardens. My advice is go slow. Yeah. Do a little bit of time. Make sure you have a plan. Wait for, uh, it's it's always that first like 55, 60 degree day. You want to get out there. Wait till you have a couple of those in a row. Yeah. That's when everything is starting to wake up. The plants are starting to wake up. The, the insects are starting to wake up a little bit. And you'll do <clears throat> uh, less ecological damage. Yeah. You're already helping out so much. You don't want to throw any of that effort away exactly. because you're a little bit too ambitious in the spring. You don't but, ruin it at the end just because you got impatient. But that was my article. Time. That was the one of the articles <laughs> I was looking at. There was another one about um, the business of, of pollination trade. And um, 
basically how a lot of the things that we really enjoy, some of the luxuries in our lives are all uh, because of pollinators in underdeveloped countries where they still have a lot of these natural places. And, uh, and we have to ship that stuff in because we don't have as many natural places in a developed country like the United States. But the article I went with really highlighted the ties between people and nature and how important that is. And I thought, oh, when I was looking at, oh, this was on from March 2nd. This is great. And then I realized it was from a year ago, March 2nd, but, a year ago. But it's still the the concept really rings true. I, you know, I, I know I picked older articles before mm-hmm. like i had one in the fall that was from may of the same year i yeah, i'm yeah. i'm fine with that and that was a complete pandering article that, if i had oh, I, admit, I was <laughs> losing left and right i needed i needed but, something uh, to get me back on track but the article i really looked at this year it was titled uh, it was from anthropocene magazine which i'd never heard of i've never heard um of but uh but they the articles i found on there were all based off of uh university studies okay. and they just kind of took that university study and just gave like a synopsis of it but this article was titled "Cities Don't Just Need oh. Uh-oh. Uh, uh, <laughs> Cities Don't Just Need Parks." That's one of my kids calling me. <laughs> I don't know. Could you? Uh, last time the phone rang, we thought it showed up, but I don't know if that, don't, anyone will hear that. I, I don't apologize. Think it will. Let's make a note of the time too, just yeah, in, just, just in case it does. Nah, I'll let it go. That's <laughs> that's fine. So, my article was "Cities Don't Just Need Parks; They Need Big Wild Ones," um, and it was written by a, a woman, Sarah. Oh gosh, I'm terrible with bad last names. De Weird, D E W E E R D T. De Weird. I, I don't know. De Weird. De Weird. I don't I know. No I'm not. You're I don't even know why person. I tried. I'm horrible. I, apparently, I I I mentioned uh, on Facebook the last time I mentioned uh, uh, Kyle, and I I'm I think I was corrected to say Liberge. <laughs> But I, it was on I, listen, I no I'm clue. horrible and I always qualify by going, I don't know. This yeah. is my best guess. But, and um, then I pronounce it like three or yeah, four I different ways. I think I said his name like Lieberger or something yeah. like that. So maybe it's Lieberger. Maybe his friend was just messing with me. I have uh, no clue. But uh, yeah, I'm terrible with last names, so and which is my last name's tough. So I have no excuse. So was so was mine. You know, I I've, I've yeah. gotten Christmas. You know, Chrismar. <laughs> Everyone adds extra R's yeah. to it. Chrisman, Chris. You know, so I I get it. But uh. Basically, this article revolved around how much, especially in cities, we need nature. Uh, And it was based off a study that was done at Seattle's Discovery Park, which Seattle's Discovery Park is like a 500 acre park. At least at the time this was written, it was a 500 acre park where there were some areas that were fairly wild um, and and undeveloped, I guess is one way to put it. Okay. And uh, basically, they were saying the fullest benefits that citizens get from nature come from these wildest areas they don't necessarily come from going to the park and seeing the grass and sitting on a park bench uh that's nice but you don't get as much of the benefit yeah and uh basically what they did is they the researchers invited visitors from of this park to submit online comments about their most meaningful experiences with nature from inside the park uh basically most of the the uh responses a quarter of the responses all had to do with inter- interaction with wildlife. Mm-hmm. Um, and then a fifth of responses had walking down like a trail somewhere in this park. Um, and then they took it a step further and started to measure meaningful interactions. So interactions that um, <clears throat> kind of referenced like a, a sense of peace or tranquility mm-hmm. or something that brought the higher level it wasn't, oh, I went in the park and I saw a squirrel. Yeah. It was I saw, I saw a, a hawk and it made me feel this way. Yeah. I saw, I was able to look out over the water and it made me feel this way. Um, and then they even took it a step further and tracked those interactions to, and made it relative to the wildness in the park. Yeah. So like I said, it wasn't, they track and say, oh, this interaction was on a park bench right off the, the path and you could still hear the cars going by and look yeah. over the grass. This place was close to a pond that was in a more remote area of the park. And, uh, and what they found was uh, the interactions and how meaningful they were directly correlated to the wildness of where in the park they were. Okay. Um, and uh, for example, or, or I'll go into the stats first. 75% were linked directly to the wildness in the park. 95% of the meaningful interactions ones where they felt an emotional feeling um were linked to wildness and 96 percent of the positive psychological interactions were linked to where the wildest areas in this park were um so it's things like 
I saw an eagle. Well, you're not going to see that in a little pocket park that you're going to have yeah. in other parts of the city where it's a block or two. Yeah. You're only going to have that in areas where you're going to have like 500 acres yeah. or, or more of of wild in a way. Um, and even so, it's still a park, so it's not completely wild. Like if you're in the, the back country of Montana, you're in no. downtown Seattle and then no, you're in a park. But, but we've but, talked about that with fragmentation too. Just yeah. because you mm -hmm. might have an acre – it it doesn't support like if you had a ten acre it's lot and you fragmented but, it yeah, to the, one acre. You're the not bigger gonna... it is, the more yeah. uh, the you can support uh, animals and, and wildlife that needs a larger range. Yes, yeah. So um, so that was really really interesting that they found that people they found that they were in a better psychological state going to these wild areas. They had more meaningful interactions where they were moved by nature in a way in these wild areas more so than like I said, sitting on a park, park bench and feeding bread to a squirrel or a yeah. duck or something like that. They were having these meaningful interactions with, with wilder areas in a way. And, um, and it well, makes sense. I mean, yeah. And, oh, and, yeah. And Dr. Emil DeVito, when he was on, was saying he would love for someone to do a study with mental health as far mm -hmm. as related to open space and parks yeah. and, and yeah. how that affects someone's mental health. And I think yeah. this alone is, is saying oh, yeah. that, yes, it does. And I'll touch on, there is some research that was done on that. Okay. I meant to comment on it another time. But um, one of the things that they questioned with this study was the demographics of the study. It was the, the air, that area tends to be a more, uh, well, one white and affluent yeah. area. Okay. So they were saying if you had it in another area and obviously you can't replicate because they don't have those kind of parks yeah. in the other areas. But uh, if you had different demographics, would those experiences tend to be the same? Yeah. You know, it one would, could say yes, but you you don't know until you do that kind of a study. You know, it would be interesting to see you know a study years down the road of like Harrison Avenue landfill. Yeah. You know, in mm -hmm. Camden, and and because that's such an important space to that mm -hmm. uh, locale. Yeah. That I think mm -hmm. that would be a great study for yeah. something like that. And uh, the other thing they said is, actually, this park they were actually looking at developing some housing units and removing some of the the park. Okay. Um. And they're saying, well, at what point do you lose a lot of those benefits? Like how small does the park have to be to lose those benefits? And what is the actual, like, I don't want to say economic cost, but what is the cost of losing those benefits on psychological health, yeah. on, on uh, well, mental health, off of physical health, those kind of things when you don't have those meaningful interactions with nature anymore. So that was, it was a really interesting concept. Yeah. Um, one that, I think you and I probably take it for granted because yeah. we live in an area where you can be five minutes away from a nature. Exactly. Um, and you don't get that in cities. You don't. So you don't. But that's a great article. I will touch on what you just said with uh, the mental with health, the mental health side of, um, of nature, but they've done a lot of studies and uh, really what is prompted is a lot of biophilic design where you're incorporating mm -hmm. nature into buildings, whether it's courtyards or, or those kind yeah. of things. But incorporating more natural areas and water into buildings, uh, they found that just having a window in a hospital room, you heal a certain percentage faster. If you were to bring a fake plant inside, you heal even faster. If you bring a real plant, it's even higher than that. So just having some semblance of nature wow. really helps you heal in a way. Yeah. Like from physical ailments, you will heal. Uh, they found the same thing in classrooms. Just having a window, you you learn more or you learn um I'm better <laughs> learn you learn you yeah. learn better if you do this i don't know that's probably the right way to say it but you learn um more efficiently uh if you have plants in the classroom it just it gets faster or better and better the closer you are to plants yeah uh same thing with office spaces they've been having a window your your team is more productive having I plants in the office makes your employees more productive having so you know sitting next to a window next to a garden for me mm -hmm. here is huge yeah for me yeah. seriously i i i ponder you know i take little mental you know 10 second 15 second breaks just mm -hmm. seeing what's going on outside yeah so to emil's point it's like the studies are actually already being done um but you don't necessarily even just need open space you just need a window yeah and you get results and the more and more or i don't there's probably a, a place of diminishing returns where you get closer to nature closer to plants and eventually it starts to level off wow. or, or you you're spending you too lose, much time you're spending yeah. too much time in nature but um from what they've tracked in office school classroom and hospital mm -hmm. settings there's so many benefits to just having nature 
That's uh, huge. Like outside That's huge. Or, or inside. That's yeah. huge. That's awesome. Great article. So, Great yeah. article. How about I, yours? What's your article? Well, I think your article article is going to win because I specifically <laughs> chose this article to lose. I want this one to lose. I don't want one vote. I don't even want a pity vote on this one. I want you to well, destroy yeah, me on this one. For, for our listeners, you're not necessarily voting on the article itself. You can vote for the article yeah. itself, but you're we're more want you to vote on who did a better job of presenting their article. I'll do a horrible <laughs> job presenting it then. So then, this one, you know, and I chose this article <coughs> – because I feel as though it was irresponsible reporting, mm -hmm. and um, and I don't agree with the article at all. And it's it's presented as factual, but there's no scientific data to back the food web claims that are made in this article. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to go into to extreme detail. So uh, they make a lot of food web claims regarding insects. I think it's very generic and and opinionated piece. Um, and it's to me, it's one where people value themselves as humans above the rest mm -hmm. of the ecosystem. So, um, this is another article from fizz.org where, where I do get a lot of my native plant articles. And it's by Ian D. Rotherman. And the name of it is Ecofusion is the New Normal as Native and Non Native Species Mixed Together. Now, is that factual? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it really is. When you look at the amount of, of invasives um, that, have taken over and we, we spend so many episodes you know there's a reason why there are invasive species strike teams mm -hmm. and how much time and money and energy that we spend eradicating invasives the stance on this article is that we shouldn't do it because you can't you can't visit mm -hmm. you're never going to get ahead you're never going to fix it so just let it take over and it, whatever's strong enough to survive it's the survival of the fittest at this point and at this point there's so many exotic species that it's a mix of native and non-native anyway. So it's, we have a mixed ecosystem, just leave it mixed because mm -hmm. it's providing function. And he was like, Oh, the insects use both anyway. Well, that's, there's, yeah. there's proof that that's not true. Um, mm -hmm. It's maybe the exotic ones are liking the exotic and, and, you know, we, we see, and we've talked about it with the article that we did in Oahu yeah, um, yeah. and, and things like that. So, He's just saying that a, a pure standpoint isn't feasible, um, that wildlife itself is a combination of native and non-native. This is a new normal, especially with climate change regimes. Everything's changing every way. So his whole, his whole opinion is throw your hands up in the air and just say, I give up mm -hmm. and just let it go. Well, we see the damage that it's, it's causing, and it's worth preserving what we have before it's lost. Mm -hmm. Is it costing a lot of money? Yeah, we need to get better at not putting the Band-Aid on the back end, but preventing more of it happening yeah, yeah. And, and future outbreaks and future invasives. So it's – you know, his whole, his whole point is, well, people like these exotic species. That's why they're here anyway, so just let people have what they want and what they like. <laughs> so I just felt, wow, that is very – a self-centered point of view. And not looking yeah. at the health of the entire <clears throat> ecosystem, you're looking at what a, you're looking at traditional gardening as a human. Mm -hmm. Like I want what I like, and you know everything else can deal with it. And you know, I'm uh, reading an article like that is a standpoint that we haven't learned anything from our mistakes. Mm -hmm. And I think we have, just not this person. I hopefully there's more people that that think like us than think like that. Yeah, and <clears throat> not having read the article, but but listening to your synopsis of it yeah. non-natives and even invasive yeah. they do contribute ecologically yeah there in is, a way there is some truth to what he's there's saying there's things I'm like not arguing carbon that. sequestration yeah. there's things that they they replace but like you mentioned it breaks up so much of the food web and uh, i think of, of blaine rothhauser's yeah. research with his moth nights where he literally can tell you what plants are there just based off of off of the moths, moths that show up over the course of the night yeah. and some moths are showing up at 9 p.m or, or 10 p.m some of them are showing up at two in the morning some of them only need or will only feed off of cottonwood trees or not the moth yeah. but the the larval stage so he knows that there's cottonwood trees there if that moth is there yeah. so if you if you especially specifically if you allow invasives to, yeah. to take over you lose so much of that plant diversity which therefore you lose so much of that insect, insect. diversity and that was what i was mm. going to say next actually was yeah you may have a functioning fusion ecosystem mm -hmm. but with such a lack of diversity 
what functions are it actually performing to sustain yeah. life, yep. you know, for everyone, if, if you're, you're looking at it at a certain scale, if you did that globally, mm-hmm. I think it would be a really hard, uh, you know, it, we would, you know, you actually just were talking about a study. What was the other article with the, how you were saying with underdeveloped countries? Oh yeah. So the, the other article I was written out was also, also from Anthropocene yeah. magazine. And, um, but it was, in short, it was talking about how these uh, these underdeveloped countries, like take a cup of coffee, for instance. Yeah. If you're having a cup of coffee, say you went to Dunkin' Donuts or Starbucks and you got like a, a mocha cup of coffee. Yeah. Well, the chocolate in there is pollinator pollinated. Yeah. And the coffee is pollinator pollinated. And it's not by honeybees. It's by yeah. unique insects that are, that are native to that area and they rely yeah. off of those uh, really specific connections between the plants that are native to there and um, yeah. and themselves yeah. and they're they that have rely off evolution. of each other. yeah and um, we aren't able or we have fewer of those complex relationships because we've we don't know how much we've lost we just know that we've had to have yeah. lost some of these relationships yeah. over time because we've introduced invasive species we're clearing land for for agriculture and and housing and warehousing and that kind of stuff so uh when you do that you're losing those relationships that are developed between plants and insects which is really the base 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 of our food web um and so who knows what kind of things we've lost just because we've done that and if you if Um, if you don't learn from those mistakes and you just keep continuing who knows what uh, else you you lose maybe that cup of coffee which is now already outrageous in price yeah becomes 15 dollars for a cup of coffee um, but in that article that that was their argument is you go to some of these under or undeveloped nations or or also lesser developed nations they still have a lot of these wild areas where they haven't been able to go you go to brazil they are clear cutting parts of the amazon for yeah. avocados and all different kinds of things they can grow but there's parts they just haven't gotten to yet that yeah. are in that are wild and almost in a pristine untouched state yeah there aren't people there so uh and that's where some of these pollinators that's where they originate from is those yeah. kind of areas so yeah. so uh, that was probably a little too complex for me to no, tackle but in, that, that, in that 15 minutes or so cooperates but my thinking yeah. with this article now the mm-hmm. article i i originally was going to pick was i think it was through penn state cooperative extension mm-hmm. where citizens have started uh cataloging what eats what are predators yeah. to uh spotted lantern fly so they were mm-hmm. noting that things like uh cardinals and blue jays had been eating it mm-hmm. in certain like mantises and, and yeah. insects yep. and spiders that that will prey on it so that you can build habitats in your yard to attract these songbirds to help predate mm-hmm. spotted lanternfly, which I thought was a great article that citizens coming together and actually doing science to help solve a problem rather than chemicals yeah. or something like that. So, but I chose this one because I was so angry yeah. <laughs> at it yeah. that I wanted to bring light to it because these are the types of articles that I'm afraid go to someone that isn't informed and sees that and goes, mm-hmm. oh, this is a really good point. This is a scientific article, and mm-hmm. I'm going to follow these steps. So yeah. I just want to bring it to the light that, no, I, I I don't think that these are the correct steps, yeah. and, and I would hate for mm-hmm. that to be someone's first experience with mm-hmm. with, with nature and native mm-hmm. plants. So so I, I think we've both made a really good – presentation oh yeah and and now it's up to everyone else yeah and of course the choice is yo go vote go vote now now you can oh, wait, or, yeah. or when it comes up <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'll, I'll i'll do my very best to make sure it comes out at a reasonable hour on friday all right uh i'm gonna say by 2 p.m all right that's i think i can do that. that's reasonable i might i wonder if there's a way i can pre-schedule it. i know for oh, regular I posts can. i can i don't oh, know if i can pre-schedule i don't know for a group. page yeah i don't know so, for well, a page I'll, I'll make it happen. All right. Are you are you ready? We did get questions this week. Are you ready for some questions? Yeah, I'm ready. All right. I want to ask you a bunch of questions. I want to have them answered immediately. It's a simple question. Um, no, I didn't hear you. What was your question? All right. So we, we have a new caller, someone that hasn't called in before, which, well, which I applaud. I love that. So let's get right into it. Hey, this question is for Jim and Pam. Uh, this is Eric, otherwise known as Dr. Evil. I wanted to put out a question there. It's really, what is the role of local ecotypes in an environment?
environment that's changing, specifically with respect to global climate change. And as zones, uh, as antiquated notion as zones are, uh, move north, uh, what should we be doing about local ecotypes, realizing this might be really dependent on the species? But I'm looking for some commentary on that. I try to buy all local ecotypes, but I am concerned about long-term prospects. Okay, that's it. I love the show. Thank you guys very much. I, I think that's a great question. And, oh, yeah. And uh, I love that we have someone calling in that goes by Dr. Evil. <laughs> yeah. So you are now officially Dr. – actually, Dr. Evil left us a very nice and funny five-star review on Apple, mm -hmm. which is Pam is a great social lubricant. Yeah. So, <laughs> I love that. I love that our listeners are embracing the whole Jim and Pam. Oh yeah, you yeah, know, I I I love that. So thank you for calling in. Um, my my personal opinion on on this is I know and and you were saying antiquated, like seed zones being mm -hmm. antiquated. I'm not a huge fan of those seed zone maps. Um, th to me, they're they're broken down too small. Um. Because it's not like climate change is a new thing. Things have evolved and changed over time naturally for for centuries. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's it's a fact. Like we've seen sugar maple zone moving further north. We've seen where the line between the southern form of Nyssa sylvatica or black gum and the northern uh, species start to shift further north. Like so, we know it's happening. It it depends on what you consider local ecotype. You know, and, mm -hmm. and that's an argument in itself. Are you going to go um, strictly with the seed map and, and smaller? I, I think it's a wider radius than that, unfortunately, yeah. because things do change. Things are going to mm -hmm. change naturally over time. And there's a difference. Um, I'm trying to figure out how where I want to start with this. There's, there's a yeah. lot here. Yeah, so there is. there's a, a difference first between herbaceous plants and woody plants yeah. especially long-lived trees you have something like a white oak yeah. can live for over 300 years that's climate change is going to play a huge role in the lifespan of that that plant yeah. where you take something like cardinal flower where it's only going to last that that individual is only going to last what two or three years probably yeah. well climate change isn't really going to matter um now for the the population where they're constantly dropping seed and there's offspring coming up well then it will start to matter a little bit more but even then 50 years of of cardinal flower is going to be so many different generations yeah. versus one white oak that can live that entire yeah. time so there's actually something i was included in this conversation and i wish i remembered more this is yeah. three or four years ago i was in kentucky for uh, a program <clears throat> through the uh, u.s forest service where they were talking about seed, um, basically all these seed zones that they were coming up with in almost as a substitution. I don't want to say a substitution. Uh, I don't even want to say it was an alternative. It was in addition to eco regions and they were actually mapping out uh, climate change and saying if climate change accelerates at the rate that they're predicting. Um, and they had a couple different rates in this model set up. And it would show if you were going to plant a tree that was going to live for a hundred years, where would you need to, where could you get that seed from that would match the climate a hundred years from now um, today? And it was, if you want to do something in Southern New Jersey, maybe you're looking in a hundred years from now, maybe you're looking at someplace in North Carolina. Yeah. But that's a, a large tree that's going to last a long, long time. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and, I, I wish I could find the link. <laughs> I'll try. Yeah. I'll find it. But, and then I will, I know I have it in an old email and, here. And we're approaching this. Both of us are approaching this from a standpoint that yeah. we're proponents of local provenance. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we're, we're firm believers. It's just, you know, we've seen, and there's so many schools of thought we've seen, there was a project up in Jamaica Bay, New mm -hmm. York, going back years, uh, years ago, probably 10 years ago or more where they wanted the plants that were planted at the Bay grown from seed that was collected from the community in, mm -hmm. in that location. Now there were other things involved, but it was, I, I don't want to go into that, but Ari Novi, who is now, I don't even know where he's at now, but he was the director at the national arboretum. He's moved, he's on. moved on. Yeah. He's moved that. on. But at the time he was a graduate student at, mm -hmm. at Rutgers and did research because they, they wouldn't accept plants that we grew from New Jersey 
but they were only eight miles away through water, uh, by way of water. And when they did the genetic study, he, he found there was no difference in genetics from where we collected it to where that was. So their school of thought was, no, it has to be from this distinct community because it's um, a, a community that's different uh, or acts differently than, than most other places and outside of this community is unacceptable. And when they did the genetic testing, they found absolutely no difference from eight miles away in a different state, but just on the mm -hmm. other side of the water. So, you know, I, I feel it's it's a mile radius that's constantly changing. And if it's close and, enough- And it changes that, per, by species too. Yeah, and, uh, and like you said, like if you're planting something now and now it's a local provenance as of today and it's a long lived tree, it's not going to be 200 years from now. And are you mm -hmm. jump starting that by changing that provenance? I don't know that answer. Yeah. Um, I, I think you, you match it up to what we're at today and, and you get as close as you can. And mm -hmm. sometimes that's not always feasible, but it shouldn't prevent you from doing restoration. Like mm -hmm. you don't want to blindly just say, I'll take whatever. Yeah. You still try to, you know, if you can't get something reasonably close, then, then what else can you use? Yeah. And uh, something um, that also came up at that, that conversation was people really were saying, well, when we boil this down, is it, like a region level is at a state level is at a county level yeah uh, and it was actor actually dr Dwayne estes this is actually yeah. i think where i met him uh he said and uh, and dr Dwayne estes is from um uh southeastern yeah. grasslands initiative uh he said well for a lot of species it comes down to a population level so yeah. if you aren't getting like seed from that population yeah. well it could be different 200 feet away well it's, you uh, you were actually saying that was it the new jersey dep with with redbud trees they yeah, don't want yeah uh they don't necessarily want to bring in well most of the um a lot of the red buds are coming from other areas and they feel uh, specific people within dp feel like it's polluting the the rare genetics of new jersey there are new, eastern redbud is rare in new jersey um and now you're bringing in plants from other areas is it polluting the genetics of these rare species we have left and these are all really good questions yeah. you know and yeah. we could probably do a rooted discussion just on, there was, on provenance there um, was another study i saw that they took uh when it came down to to provenance where they had i don't remember what plant it was and i don't remember where it was <laughs> what what part of the country but it was a plant and they took and sampled the the genetics of it and they were only like 300 feet away, but one was in a dry spot at the top of the hill. One was in a wet wetland at the yeah. bottom of the hill. And they actually found that the genetics were more different than they had another plant of that same species that was from all the way across the state. And that was grown in a dry site. Yeah. Well, the ones that were grown in dry sites were closer genetically than the ones that were only 300 feet yeah. apart, even though there was hundreds of miles between the two. Yeah. So there's a lot of things that go into it. There, there really is, and and the best you can do is is your best. Yeah, try your best. It's yeah. I I don't know what the exact answer is, or if there is an exact answer. I I think we've seen jobs occur where it's the seed has to be collected within 50 miles mm -hmm. of the the planting site, or 100 miles. We've seen up to 250 miles when something is is harder to find in that mm -hmm. in that range. Yeah. Um, I don't know that I agree with 50 miles. I don't know that I agree with 250 miles. Yeah. You know, it's, I, I think there has to be somewhat of a balance yeah. and sometimes it's easier to get seed within a certain area. Another, it's uh, not. another issue that, that I brought up to this, this panel was, um, you got to figure out if the seeds available or not. If you, yeah. if you can't find it yourself or you aren't comfortable propagating yourself yeah. and, uh, and you're going to buy it from someone, would you rather deal well? And this was the example I used. We were in Kentucky. I was dealing or sitting next to the owner of Roundstone Seeds, which is a great seed company in Fantastic Kentucky. people, yeah. And I was saying, well, say we're doing a project in New Jersey, and I might, like being from New Jersey, I might have the the closest ecotype seed that I collected from. I could have even collected from where you want to plant this, yeah. the, the plants. But if I'm not answering the phone or not answering emails or, uh, or, my product is full of weeds or yeah. there's pro issues with my product. Are you going to be able to, okay, maybe I have the best or my prices are through the roof. Yeah. If I'm hard to do business with, well, and it's easy to do business with this outfit in Kentucky. Well, why wouldn't you 
get it from them. Yeah. Like there's other things in addition there's to factors. there's, there's yeah. human factors that go along with it yeah. in addition to actually the, the ecotype. So yeah. that's, if I had to summarize and, and give my opinion, I would say there's a big difference between if you're planting herbaceous material or short lived material, I guess I'll phrase yeah. it that way instead, or long lived material. Um, even shrubs that are going to last like 15, 20, yeah. 30, 40 years, try and get them as close as you can from a reputable source. Yes. That's, that's probably the biggest thing is get it from a reputable source. Uh, we've talked about a bunch of them on here before. You have, what's it? I'll even list off the ones yeah. off the top of my head. Sure. Um, well, Prairie Moon, Prairie Nursery. Yeah. Uh, you have American Meadows, I think is up in Vermont or Massachusetts, yeah. and they're pretty good with a lot of stuff. Um, oh man, I'm missing a whole part of the country. Okay. You have a Native American seed down in yeah. Texas. There's a whole bunch on the West Coast that I, um, they're blanking on me right now. Uh, New Jersey specifically, you have Toad Shade, Wild Ridge, Earth First, yeah. um, uh, New Moon yeah. has a, a, they have a thing called Pollination. Yeah um Izell native plants actually works with a lot of different they vendors. work with north creek and uh, people north like creek that kind of so. growers who've been on the show before uh but i know they deal with some folks out in other parts of the country as well you know but so. a lot of times that material like that information is not in literature if, if you're mm -hmm. curious and you're going to buy something ask what the provenance is yeah. we yeah. we collect our seed ourselves so we we catalog it we know i can look in the computer and say the seed is from mm -hmm. this county of this state um, most most reputable nurseries can tell you that yeah. if you get a I don't know then so that then, would be my number one thing yeah. is work consider is it short lived long lived yeah. um, work with people who are reputable and can at least tell you where that seeds yeah. from um, those are probably two big things yeah. and then my personal opinion is try and stick to as close as possible within those other two yeah other two. Uh, criteria right. is if I can find it from a reputable dealer and it's fairly close and uh, and it tends to be short lived. Oh yeah. Then go with that person that you like. That's, that's close to you. Yeah. That's probably the best option. I say we should probably move on. We're already Definitely. at about 50, <laughs> 50, over knew, 50 minutes. We knew and, it was going to be, we haven't one. even covered the shrub <laughs> topic yet. So we, we did get, uh, we were worried on the last episode of the buzz because we hadn't heard from our friend Saul and he graced us with a phone call this week. So you ready? Mm -hmm. All right. Hi, hi, fellas. Hi, it, it's your buddy Saul 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 Rosenberg. I'm I'm okay. I I guess uh, uh, Pam and 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 Tom. See Tom. I remember Tom. <laughs> Thank God. Tommy. No, Thomas. Thomas, like the English muffin. <laughs> Tom, the, Thomas, the English muffin. With the nooks and, and, and the crannies, you, you boys remember that. I'm certain. I'm very certain. Anyway, the other day, fellas, I was. I'm so excited with the natives. I was making bog iron, you know, like the bat stove and, and the furnace. And anyway, I was firing up the furnace, and my leg got shot hard with a piece of the iron, and it swole all up like a balloon. Or, or, or a dirigible or, or like a Zeppelin. You know what I mean, Pam. You, you know. Anyway, fellas, lately I've had a topic I'm concerned with. It is the herds of marauding sheep what are coming around. And I imagine you've read about this yourselves and are also concerned. So, the sheep. Anyway, I'm open to suggestions as always for a native shrub, perhaps as a barrier, a barrier island, if you will. And uh, to shoo them away like a shoe or, or perhaps a boot to boot them. And I was thinking of the Kalmia, which is also, I believe, called the sheep killer. So perhaps uh, that could be a discussion. And, and when we are over, fellas, this uh, so-called social, so-called distancing, I believe, so-called distancing, which I've been practicing for about 40 years. I don't know what <laughs> the big thing is, but I'm worried that people, uh, bad people may try to burst into my home and steal the family jewels. Uh, no, no pun intended there, Pam, you know, but there are, so are there plants that I could use as a self-defense, you know, like a, a pepper spray or a mace to make those miscreants away like a club and, and, and have you heard of the pepper bush, which I was thinking could be helpful uh, as, as perhaps an armorant? 
It's called the Clethra, the, the Alnifolia. And I, I wondered if I could make maybe a club out of that and, and, and club somebody <laughs> bad if, if they would try to invade the, the, the garden of, of loneliness here. Now, fellas, remember, remember my theme here in New Jersey. If it grows in the garden state, then it belongs on your dinner plate. <laughs> Thank you, Pam and Thomas, the English muffin. <laughs> this is your friend Saul, uh, gardening in New Jersey. Goodbye. Uh, I don't even know where to start. I will say, I'm starting to think Pam maybe isn't so bad, Mr. Yeah. English muffin. <laughs> he is getting your name right, but <laughs> yeah, that is good. And and English muffins are delicious. They are so. delicious. I, I like the nooks and crannies. They hold the butter yeah. really well. So Definitely. maybe that's not eh, maybe that's not so bad. So <laughs> I do have a question though. You can't make bog iron, right? Bog iron no. is just in the bog. It's iron no, in the bog. So that was he referenced uh, a, a bat stow, and we have bat which was a, in New Jersey was a um a historic uh village, mm -hmm. and um but basically it was during the Revolutionary War. Yeah. They and prior they harvest the bog ore okay. and then make bog uh, iron bog iron and then okay. you'd make uh, pots and pans and right. i think during the revolutionary war they used it to to it was very important because that was a place they could make iron okay um in the colony so i stand corrected so, that's yeah. that's very uh thrifty of him making oh, yeah. his own bog yeah bog it's a iron. very complex process and it wasn't a very good iron yeah and <laughs> apparently remember, remember from my like middle school field trip to bat stuff and i'm wondering what kind of safety that <laughs> that saul is practicing because he seems to get hurt again yeah, yeah. again awful lot so I want to know where in new jersey he lives with the marauding hordes of sheep. <laughs> 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 which I, it could be close to one of these solar farms because that's become popular is to it plant is. solar farms with a uh, well this doesn't go always hand in hand but they'll plant them with native plants and then let the sheep go to kind of graze them instead of mowing i believe that's what yeah. princeton university does yeah. with their solar they were one of the first ones so, i remember doing that yeah. so but i believe the sheep killer he's he's referring to is actually sheep laurel which mm -hmm. is if i remember correctly calmia and gustafolia is mm -hmm. is sheep laurel so which is a great native plant but it's also a very difficult one to grow that's mm -hmm. you don't find it in production often because it's hard to grow from seed and it's a very slow yeah. grower but i don't know about marauding sheep herds of sheep Her <laughs> 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 that sounds like a monty python skit yeah. actually but he might be able to fix that problem and get rid of the the so-called distancers that are going to be breaking into his house. I have a feeling a lot of same, people are confusing thing. social yeah. distancing and so-called distancing. <laughs> you, but yeah. Pepper Bush does not make pepper spray, so that would maybe not be a great one. Yeah. But you know, the shrub that from that's hot. We talked about Rosa of Virginiana, mm -hmm. or maybe if it's a wetter area, swamp rose or mm -hmm. uh, pasture rose, Carolina rose. Uh, any of those would be great for they're they're nice and thorny and mm -hmm. they they will help with wildlife but also detract from from miscreants at, yeah attacking was, the, the garden of loneliness <laughs> even on a uh there's a dispute about a um a retention basin on a uh development call i was on last week and that was the uh, the lawyer's advice said, I found fences don't work keeping kids out, but thorny bushes do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so that might work. So I would go with a lot of the native roses mm -hmm. in New Jersey. Um, I, I think of his garden of loneliness much like Superman with his uh why can't I think of where he goes solid fortress of solitude? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I kind of figure, yeah. although with plants. You know, yeah. I, I, I kind of picture that song. But it seems his... he wants to keep it lonely. At first we thought he was just, just a lonely. lonely guy, but it seems like he wants to keep it lonely if he's yeah. trying to keep people out and keep the sheep yeah. out. And, and he's worried and about those that. family jewels. Yeah. You got to protect the family yeah. jewels. I, so. I wonder what, <laughs> you know what, never mind. <laughs> yeah. But the one thing I do want to, I, I totally disagree with his, if it grows in the garden state, it belongs on your dinner plate. Not true. We've already, he mm. did try to already eat winterberry, which we've, we, we now know are toxic to yeah. humans that you shouldn't eat. And there's a lot of yeah. other toxic uh, plant material. But it didn't that, take old down old Saul. So. No, he's still, <laughs> he's still, still alive and kicking, making his bog iron. <laughs> 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 we need a tour of, of Saul's, garden of loneliness yeah. i want to see where he's making the bog iron but 
one of the things Saul really kicked this into, and this was a lot of the theme of today's episode, was shrubs. He was yes. looking for like hedgy shrubs specifically, and but shrubs in general are more than just a hedge. They yeah. they can be food for wildlife. They're they're beneficial for birds, insects. So there's some of the the earliest food for for pollinators yeah. in a lot of cases. It's more um, than just a flower. It's more than just a berry. It's, yeah. it, they perform very specific ecosystem functions mm -hmm. as far as foraging and habitat and nesting. And there's there's a lot of a lot of great functions. So we we kind of started off. I think most people probably could define this one, but we've started off each topic with a definition. So mm -hmm. when you look up a shrub, the definition is a woody plant which is smaller than a tree and has several main stems arising at or near the ground. So like a multi-stem, most shrubs are, are multi-stem. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's a great place to start. Oh, and yeah. We kind of put together just like a quick list and I thought we could go into some of the specifics and Definitely. like, like Definitely. we have been. And if you want, you can kick it off and start wherever you yeah, want. Yeah. So I know if we go back to, to Doug Talmy, Dr. Doug Talmy's list of his favorite plants, one of the ones that was on there was Prunus, the yeah. Prunus, uh, Prunus general, family. The so. Prunus family. And man, there are so many. Um, I always considered Prunus serratina, the, the wild black cherry, a tree. I I would too. And, I mean, because uh, it's but 40, I've heard 45. it referenced as a shrub before. I would, which I was always surprised by. But I there's other choke cherry is technically a shrub. Mm -hmm. I think if I remember correctly, that's something we don't grow. I'm not as familiar, but yeah. I want to say choke cherry is maybe a shrub. But uh, but you also have in along the coast you have beach plum beach which plum, is a fantastic which, yeah uh, not just for for well birds and bees and butterflies but also for people so yes it's one of uh, uh i was at a plant sale and i sold some beach plums to someone and uh and they said oh how long are you gonna be here i was like oh probably another hour he's like okay i'll be right back i guess they lived around the corner okay they drove home and then came back and gave me a jar of their homemade beach plum jam oh, oh my it? god it was so was good great. we mm -hmm. sold some a few years ago, and I can't remember to the organization, but they called back and they were excited because they got rare yellow fruited hmm. ones, uh, which they said are very genetically difficult to come by. And they really wanted to know about everything where we collected it, <laughs> like everything, and they were yeah. hoping to get more, but it was just they managed to get two and we didn't have any more that fruited yellow. So, um, you know, when we collect, we always try to collect from a large diversity of plant yeah. material uh and, and different places so uh yeah. you, you do get those genetics but it's very important with two two people and and wildlife with what it produces yeah. another one that i'm not as familiar with but i hear it on a lot of these like um wildlife habitat uh management groups is american plum yeah and i've heard that is like really really good for wildlife and i'm sure it, people can eat it as well i've had american plum wine really yeah that which was which was agatha wasn't a fan i loved it yeah i thought it was mm -hmm. great yeah it was really strong too <laughs> yeah <laughs> so but yeah no really really but good. uh that's one of the ones when they talk about it uh, a lot of the folks i know that are in that are from the midwest or down south and that's one of their favorite plants is, yeah. is american plum that's a great one uh we have button bush which to me is there's not too many things when when we're talking about Forbs and grasses, and we get a lot of questions about how, how many inches of permanent inundation can these plants take. And when you get to the woodies, you're really limited when mm -hmm. it comes to inundation, but button bush is one that can live in water. Mm -hmm. uh, plus the, the, the flower is so different and striking. It's, it's, it's an obligate, I believe, but can take it in a little bit drier mm -hmm. conditions as well. Uh, it, it's just a great, the, the, the flower is just so unique that it's a must have if you can if you can get one in your garden yeah i would i yeah. would i would agree they're very cool and that's uh cephalanthus occidentalis. occidentalis yeah so um your amelanchier species which we grow amelanchier candensis, candensis but there's what's it? amelanchier there's latus. latus and there's another one that's uh it's popular with one of the crosses, but I can't remember off the top yeah. of my head. It's Lavis and something else crossed, make yeah, like grandifolia. grandifolia. I think it's grandifolia. Uh, but I don't remember what it's crossed with, but that's but, also native in but our area. Early blooming, like mm -hmm. to me, that's that could be a, an understory tree. It's a large, another one that's yeah. a large, because you, you can get it single stem, um, but very early flowering white flower, yeah. kind of around the same time mm -hmm. as red bud. And, and great interesting fruit. common name, or, or the multiple common names, you yeah. have shadbush. Yeah. which in our area along Delaware River, it bloomed when the shad were running. Yeah. Uh, and American shad are 
less and less common, but yeah. um, when we talked with the Nature Conservancy, when they opened up, uh, was it the Columbia Dam? I think uh, it was, was on the Columbia. Musconetcong River. Yeah. Um, they saw shad running up that river the year after they, they removed the dam. So there's still a run. It used to be a huge, huge commodity fish species in mm. New Jersey and Pennsylvania. Uh, not so much anymore. I think there's one legal harvest that takes wow. place every year now and is one one uh, residual company that still does it yeah. and they basically do it out of tradition but um and then uh service berry is another common service name. berry which was it would set fruit was it fruit or it was flowers, it was flowers Fla- as it would well. flower when the ground had thought enough to bury your dead mm-hmm. so yeah. i think that originated more up in in further north in new england yeah where, you, where the ground would freeze so hard and and you couldn't dig in it over the winter and you had to that's pretty morbid. <laughs> that is pretty <laughs> morbid. All your, but, your loved ones. But that pretty cool stories for for common names. So those yeah. are those are great. We have spice bush, which is early flowering yellow. I'm trying to remember if that's facultative or facultative wet. I don't recall either. Gets those red berries. Yeah. And um and uh we just put out an email earlier this week about how the the uh, mm-hmm. excuse me on Facebook it was the spice bush swallowtail. Yeah. That's a plant insect relationship that. The, the spice bush swallowtail needs spice bush, the particular for the larval stage, yeah. to to exist. So, so very important. And you make spice bush. You can make tea, I believe. I think so. I think yeah. that that was one that you can make tea. Um, getting a little more broad, you have the dogwoods, mm-hmm. uh, and we've talked about a lot of those. You have redwig dogwood, uh, Cornus cerisia or stolonifera. Um, you have silky dogwood. You have um, uh, what's Cornus right? Gray dogwood. Mm-hmm. There's just a lot of great understory shrubs that support so many different species, mm-hmm. um, different flowers, different berries. Just a great. They're important to me. You you can't not have yeah. dogwood shrubs. Yeah. Uh, Here's another uh, riddle for you. All right, Cornus Florida. It's a flowering dogwood. Yeah, tree or shrub? I would say tree. Yeah. I would say I, so. I would say tree too. I mean, I've seen it multi stem, you yeah. know, but I, I think for the most part, I I would consider that a small like understory tree, mm-hmm. you yeah. know, along and with, that's how I've seen it growing bud. there, like fifteen to twenty feet and, tall, and, 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 and again and the understory, like red bud, you yeah. can have it multi stem mm-hmm. where it's more of a shrub. It's it's really that's <clears throat> they're really on the the line. I don't know. Yeah. I it it could it could be genetics if you have smaller yeah. ones or not. So. Yeah. So then you have a uh, morella, which or, is bayberry. Or used to be Mirica, yeah. uh, which is your bayberry. So you have northern bayberry, which I love the smell of northern bayberry. Mm-hmm. Very big coastal plant. Uh, white berries, um, like a lot of you see bayberry candles. I think Yankee yep. Candle makes a bayberry yeah. candle. And then you have uh, wax myrtle, which is a little more southern, but you're starting to see it mm. creep north. Like it's starting to become a little more. It's it's native in New Jersey, but not in in large large numbers it's a little mm-hmm. more rare but it's starting to become a little more common now yeah and i know uh <laughs> i've seen in a lot of these native plant facebook groups how people remember their grandparents going out and collecting bayberry to make bayberry candles yeah bayberry so, candles they make good greens for mm-hmm. uh it's a semi evergreen so in warmer climates it doesn't yeah. necessarily mm-hmm. drop all of its leaves and it has a great red fall color so yeah and we've seen in the nursery they tend to hold on their leaves yeah. here in new jersey and um and get that really cool like deep red yeah. color great yeah. great christmas greens mm-hmm. you know it's, it's good for that yeah. so uh you want to go you want me to oh it doesn't matter to me oh uh elderberry <laughs> so sambucus uh canadensis which i think is a subspecies of nigra sambucus mm-hmm. nigra canadensis uh so elderberry we've we've talked waxed poetically about that mm-hmm. one with you can uh yeah. great flat flower great berry you can eat the flower flowers. you can eat the berries and uh the berries are really really high in antioxidants yeah and uh they're considered superfood now and you can go to i'm sure whole foods and wegmans and all these fancy yeah. supermarkets and they'll sell either elderberry juice or elderberry supplements because they're yeah. good they're good for your health yeah or you can just get an elderberry plant and do it yourself <laughs> that's true that's true i planted an elderberry next year or lat next year really <laughs> what is wrong with me last year um now i'm in the future i'm working <laughs> i'll work in the future in so, the past um another cool species is your viburnums and there's a lot and there's there. a lot yeah there's a lot a lot but you know, those are um uh one of my favorites is the the cranberry bush viburnum yeah but yeah, um viburnum trilobum is a great one viburnum uh, dentatum 
which is arrowwood viburnum, a uh, very important species. You have black hall viburnum, which is a, a different mm -hmm. look. It has a like a waxier leaf, gets a really nice uh, um, fall color, red fall mm -hmm. color, blackberry. Uh, you have um, the nanny berry, which, which is I, yeah, I wouldn't plant it, but I see there are quite a people who like and it. And red berry. It. And that gets yeah. quite big. That gets bigger. I, I planted one of those also, red mm -hmm. berries. So, um, you know, there's a lot of great species in the viburnum family. We're just yeah. talking to what's local here, but there's a southern arrowwood, which is uh, recognitum. I guess uh, dentatum is northern arrowwood, and mm -hmm. I think rec I can't remember the pronunciation. Recognitum, I think recognitum mm -hmm. is southern arrowwood. Yeah, and I'll I'll mention we had Sam Thayer on a couple weeks ago, and I'm working on a video of uh, an unboxing I did of all the stuff i bought all oh, of him yes and um it's taken me way too long to put that up no but, but you did share some I of the stuff with us yeah uh high bush cranberry fruit leather and yeah. then high bush cranberry jam which how both was the jam awesome. the, the fruit leather yeah. was fantastic it's it's both were like a little bit tart the, the yeah. jam was a, or i guess it was jelly it wasn't jam but um it was a uh, uh sweeter than the fruit leather was but it still had that tartness and nice. um my wife and i just had it on like a cheese board and kind of put it on the side and then you take your cracker put a little bit of the jam on it nice. put a little brie or goat cheese or whatever we had and and it was really really good awesome yeah. awesome uh you have your uh blueberries mm -hmm. so vaccinium you yeah. have the high bush blueberry and low bush blueberry mm -hmm. both really cool high bush blueberry is a is a wetland plant low bush blueberry is a as, as a much smaller upland plant mm -hmm. so we see that like covering the forest floors in in, in mm -hmm. southern new jersey and high bush blueberry gets much taller i want to say six to eight feet tall mm -hmm. uh with a, a yeah. nice red fall color um do you taste a difference in the the fruit i probably haven't had it side to side or side by you side could, enough to uh, yeah notice. i don't know that i could tell but the difference when uh, uh one of my friends and i last summer were walking around in the new jersey pine barrens and there's high bush blueberry all over and low bush blueberry yeah. all over through there but you'd walking through and it was like it was literally like a blueberry buffet and we're yeah. just walking through and you're just grabbing them as you're going that and such a great <laughs> i don't even know how many blueberries i ate that day it that, was that is one thing we're spoiled with in new jersey yeah. is blueberry yeah. um yeah. but you also have huckleberry is in that mm -hmm. uh, i'm drawing a blank on the the uh the botanical name on that one but huckleberry is also and in the cranberry is i'm not positive that, i i'm not positive <laughs> You I'm may gonna want look to look up. that one up. So while you're looking up that one, we did throw in Calicarpa americana, which is uh, uh, not really native here. It's su southern south of here, but it's beautyberry, which has a very cool uh, berry, like glossy, waxy berry uh, that's very striking. And it's it's a very more of a delicate. It doesn't have those strong, sturdy stems as you think of what viburnum. It's a little more delicate in nature. So, and the the, the berries cluster along mm -hmm. the, the the stems. Uh, Cranberry is Vaccinia macrocarpin. Okay. So, right. and that's, I guess, it's still technically a shrub if it's yeah. woody yeah. stem and, yeah. and low growing. Um, but that beauty berry is another one that, like, all of my southern friends that drive me nuts because it's not, this is one of my moral dilemmas. Yeah. It's not technically native in New Jersey. And um, it's a great plant. It's an awesome it's plant. It's a great plant. It's so cool. Like that, that brightness of the berries and how they cluster like that. It's awesome. And I'm, I keep waffling and saying, am I going to, I'm going to plant in my garden this year. And then I'm like, ah, but it's not really native here. So I want to be really strict with this. And, I don't know why I have planted. Yeah. I have non-native stuff yeah. planted in there already. So and I don't know why I'm so strict. And the berries are purple. <laughs> it's purple beauty yeah. berry. But I remember yeah. University of Delaware at some point had like a yellow bearing one and there's white mm -hmm. bearing ones yeah. and they're available in the trade. There's cultivars yeah. and things and like there that. Are, there is a non-native beauty berry too. Yeah. But one of the reasons I also get jealous about it is apparently it's great for wildlife like deer and, and quail and those kind of yeah. things love this, yeah. love beautyberry. So, so yeah, I think the, I'm trying to remember the, the non-native one is Calicarpa dicotoma, dicotoma. I think there's a yeah. handful. Of yeah. Them. So um, you have sumacs, which is another one where you could say yeah, small tree, large shrub, but we, we've talked about the importance with the berries for wildlife. Um, the fall color is wonderful. Mm -hmm. You have staghorn sumac, smooth sumac uh wing sumac so that the uh roost glabra which is smooth sumac is that the stems are smooth mm -hmm. there's there's no hair where the the staghorn sumac um 
they're pubescent. So the stems are actually furry, kind of like a staghorn, mm-hmm. like a young staghorn. Mm-hmm. And then the wing sumac has wings. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. I don't know if it's on the, on the on branchlets the... almost like on yeah. the, the leaflets. Yeah. Um, so they're, they're mm-hmm. wings. So it's, they all have, like, if you were looking at them from a distance, they all look very similar. But if you go up and inspect them, you can really see mm-hmm. the difference. And they're yeah. mo- mainly upland, dry areas, sandy, not a lot of nutrient yeah. content in the soil. And also, one of the things I didn't try <laughs> after we even talked about on the podcast was making that staghorn uh, or, or sumac lemonade out of the berries. Wasn't there something? And then I didn't try. So the, the sumac, which is the conventional spice, mm-hmm. spice in cooking, is actually um i think middle eastern yeah but they said you can use the native sumac as a, a replica in okay. a way it's not quite as flavorful but it does provide some flavor didn't we just eat so, something that had sumac as a as an ingredient i got well it was the the middle eastern su- sumac I oh, got okay with, uh, what's it za'atar okay which i don't know if you had any but i was like okay licking the inside of the, or i was licking my finger after i touched the inside right. of the cat all right but i thought well, there was something we had here that someone was saying that. oh look sumac mm-hmm. is one of the ingredients yeah. i don't remember what maybe it was, it was in that fruit leather maybe that's what, it, what was. it was yeah, yeah. so you have your choke berries which mm-hmm. again we've talked about you have your red choke berry black choke berry there is another choke berry um is it purple choke berry i think that sounds right so I, if i remember correctly one is a facultative wet, one is a facultative. I can't remember which is which. So one likes it a little bit wetter. You know, it's not it's not um, wildlife's favorite because it is a little more tart. So they tend to leave it till last. So it's it's later. You know, it's it's a good late season food source for wildlife if you're using it. Um, yeah, I can't remember what the other chokeberry is. Purple chokeberry, chokeberry. is a is a cross between red the and red black. black, which makes sense. You know, we've seen that with cardinal flower and blue lobelia Mm -hmm. where you get those natural crosses so uh a couple of things we didn't write down that i'm just thinking about off the top of my head is inkberry holly which is one of the few evergreen shrubs that we really have native and in new jersey here and it's a very nice soft uh you know evergreen Mm -hmm. shrub that's with a blackberry that's late season again we didn't uh talk about sauls the clether anifolia. We didn't talk we about didn't sweet pepper bush, which is such a wonderful summer flowering mm-hmm. with a, a sweet peppery smell uh, to the blooms and yeah. it's a uh, nice yellow fall color. We didn't talk about IT of Virginica, mm-hmm. which is uh, a Virginia, Virginia sweet, sweet spire. spire. Which actually, when we were listening to his uh, Saul's voicemail this time, I was thinking I saw a play where IT uh, Virginica was actually the resolution. It was really? called. It was called. I think it was called Native Gardens. And um, but they referenced Doug Talmy and they referenced a couple other authors, but it was a, a young, energetic, um, multicultural family moved in next door to some some old white people. And uh, and they argued. But the the new family wanted to have a whole native backyard. They were do it yourselfers. Yeah. The neighbor was a traditional English gar- gardener and he was very mean and stuffy. But um, and. I think the one, the one guy was in, I, I should yeah, go into yeah. all this stuff. I don't remember. It was basically the, they were having a bar. The new couple had a baby. They're having a barbecue or no, they were about to have a baby uh-huh. and they had the baby. That was, they're fighting a okay. lot right. over the border. And they, they, the resolution was they had the baby and that made them get along and they planted a hedge of Virginia sweet spire in between. Mm. Which is again, very, it's summer flowering. Yeah. It has a nice spire. It's fragrant. Yeah. Uh, glossier leaf it's actually stoloniferous or rhizomal i I think it's rhizomal that sounds Uh, you know so it it really suckers and Mm -hmm. and forms a colony it's colony forming um but great great deep red fall color that's a great oh yeah shrub and there was another one that i was thinking of uh well bearberry is a really low growing Growing, more of a ground cover which um, is a, a really unique evergreen uh uh, ground cover yeah that we have it's and very, um uh, there was another one i was thinking of and well, sweet fern now. sweet fern is sweet another, great another one. cool one. uh likes drier sandier soils has a great i, I always pulling leaves off and, and smelling the leaves and i've seen that used in cooking as well yeah. either the the leaves where and they'll use it as like an aromatic yeah, yeah. Uh, you can use it as tea um and you can actually eat the seeds which oh, are like little that. almost like crunchy sunflower seeds i guess okay. So well, we sh- we should probably we're actually oh yeah we're, we're, we're we only got like ten minutes left like um so do you, do you have a favorite shrub? I'm gonna go with um 
I would love to say the American Beauty Berry, but I don't have one. So I'm going to go with the the uh, Cranberry Vibe Myrnum. That's a great one. Yeah. That really is a great one. Um, now I'm de- I'm thinking Cranberry Vibe Myrnum has the red berry. I think I said Nanny Berry had red, but yeah, I don't think it is. It's a, Yeah, that has a darker. Like darker, like, yeah. a purple, like a dark purple, if mm-hmm. I remember correctly. So yeah. I'm just... I confused the two in my head. So, so I didn't plant a nanny berry. I planted a cranberry viburnum. <laughs> Probably good because <laughs> so, yeah, I don't like the nanny berries. No, the nanny they're berry great plants. Look but... Similar to black hall, they're both more on mm-hmm. the the upland, like facultative, facultative upland. So, yep. my favorite shrub, I would say sweet pepper bush. I know mm-hmm. Saul mentioned that one, but that's one of the first plants I learned when I started in the industry, and I, I, yeah, I've always kind of liked the the flowering habit and the smell mm-hmm. and the, the fall color of that one i like when you see big native stands right on the edge of the woods like in maryland yeah. Yeah. when i lived in delaware you would see them like on roadsides big natural stands and mm-hmm. you see them native around here yeah. most of the parks anyway so mm-hmm. that would be mine all right you ready cool do, i think we have time we have about 10 minutes so yeah, let's do the pod, do pod all right let's see what we get Always this curious. is our, our one moment of spontaneity Actually, this this whole episode was it's, a lot of <laughs> we, yeah. This one was way off was, off the cuff. Yeah, but uh, um. All right, let's see here. Let me just pull one out. Yeah, well, I mean, we called your wife out of the blue. Yeah, she had no idea that was going to happen. Uh, ah, uh, we can't do that. It's a reverse cast. Start with the result and work backward to the problem. Yeah, I don't know how we do that. I don't know how we do that either. Reintroduce yourself to the audience we haven't done this for 44 episodes yeah so go ahead all right you want to go you want me yeah, to go? i can go all right um how in depth do we want to go with this uh, you so, know what give yourself three minutes okay i'm gonna set a timer uh but so i am tom knezik uh now if i was to introduce myself now i'd say i'm the production analyst at pylons nursery um owner of pylons direct native plants and then the co-host of the native plants healthy planet podcast um i'm also on the new jersey nursery and landscape association from association board of directors uh the atlantic cedar Tro- association board of directors uh and i'm the secretary of the new jersey young farmer and agricultural professionals well you're involved in a lot yeah. of stuff <laughs> yeah i'm not involved that, in anything and that's all the stuff i, I do for work yeah <laughs> but, um and uh yeah, so I grew up in the native plant business. Yeah. Uh, literally, my parents started Pinelands Nursery and Supply when I, before I was born, probably through four years before I was born. And um, they moved to the property where I grew up, and uh, my home was at this nursery. So I spent a lot of my childhood swinging on the greenhouse <laughs> rungs and <laughs> climbing the rafters <laughs> of the barns and learning how to drive tractors when I was a little kid and never really understood what we were doing uh, up until... I knew how important it was. I wouldn't even say that. I didn't know how important it was. I knew we grew native plants. I knew that was different. I knew that most other places didn't do that. Uh, I didn't realize how different it was until I got to college and I was taking, I was actually a business major, uh, agricultural business major. But um, when I started taking some horticulture classes on the side and they're saying, oh, well, you need these fancy greenhouses and do things hydroponically and grow all these crazy species. And I was like, they basically said, you have to spend millions of dollars if you want to make any money. And I'm like, well, that's not how we do things. We have yeah. like these bare, bare bones greenhouses. And and um, from a success standpoint, we were they, and they were talking about these these nurseries that were started up and they were going out of business. And but they had to spend all this money and they could never get out of debt. And uh, and my parents kind of ran it the opposite way. So it was that was when I was introduced to how we were doing things so differently and what we were doing was a little bit revolutionary and how simplistic it was. Um, and then as I progressed even further and started working at the business, that's when I realized, Oh, wow, we were making a huge difference. And there's such a disconnect between conventional horticulture and ecological horticulture. And there's more and more science coming out that shows how we need to do things ecologically. And we need to merge those lines. Yeah. There shouldn't be, or ornamental horticulture and ecological it should be one yeah. um and it's probably needs to come ornamental needs to come a long way to meet ecological it shouldn't be ecological going to meet ornamental yeah. so 
That was kind awesome. of an introduction. Awesome. <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll give mine. I'll go maybe a little bit different direction than I have in the past and just elaborate a little bit more on kind of who I am. So I'm Fran Chismar. I'm the Sultan of Sales at Pinelands Nursery. I'm also the co-host of the Native Plants Healthy Planet podcast. Um I'm a father of two. I'm a single father of two about to be remarried and uh, a, a stepfather to to another child uh, soon. Um, and and those things are very important to me. Being a father is is a huge uh, deal in my life and, and changed my life drastically. And I'll, I'll go into that a little bit further. But I was I was a rebellious child <laughs> and I didn't go to college and it was at a crossroads where I was going to get kicked out of my house if I didn't get a job. And I, I, I had a friend that worked at Moon Nurseries, which is in Maryland, but at the time it was in Yardley, PA. And I started working there and it, it wasn't – to me, it was just a job, but it kind of kept me out of trouble. And at one point, my friends all moved to Colorado and it probably kept me from moving. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they all – they had no jobs or no careers or anything, and at this point I would become uh, – the wholesale yard manager at Moon Nurseries, and I, I wasn't ready to leave. And from there, I kind of, I worked at a bunch of different nurseries and a different aspects. So Moon was uh, uh, larger trees at the time with a container yard. I went to work at the Connor Pyle Company, which is Star Roses, which was a huge uh, container nursery. And also Star Roses was one of the top three nurseries for, uh, or top three rose growers behind uh, Jackson and Perkins and Weeks. Um, I had a brief stint at Imperial Nurseries and also at True Green, and then I ended up at Princeton Nurseries uh, back in New Jersey, where I, you know, which again was a, a very large tree nursery mm -hmm. and container nursery, and I was the assistant sales manager and procurement manager, and then eventually becoming sales manager, and I was the first and only non-college educated uh, sales manager at Princeton mm -hmm. Nursery through their long career, and there was a. a a long legacy of great sales managers there. So um, when they went out of business, the one thing my wife at the time had asked was, we've moved all over for your job. And now that we have kids, I, I don't want to move. So which really limited, <laughs> limited mm -hmm. my options. And at the same time, your dad needed a sales manager and really wanted someone who was grounded locally, <laughs> mm -hmm. you, you know, and it was a, a great marriage. And I, I kind of did it because I knew I'd still be able to spend a lot of time with my kids and, and be a dad, which, which I really wanted to do. And I had no idea that it would change my life the way it did. Like in no, in a way mm -hmm. that no other job that I've ever had, had, like there were all careers, but this is a way of life for me. And it's, I found family here and, you know, and we talked about the, how that's a core value of so many of the people oh, that yeah. work here. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and it really, I can't imagine not doing this. It's its not like if I were to switch jobs, I would stop thinking mentally the way I do about these things. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, let's just say I were to go off and do something completely different. It, it wouldn't change how I feel. I can't imagine not doing this for a living now, where at the other jobs, I could see myself not doing it anymore. Yeah, yep. You know, it, it made a difference that way. So, um but just re real quick, you know, passionate besides this, I, I love sports. I love music. I'm mm -hmm. a huge music fan. I I had my own music blog for the longest time, uh, the My Music, My Concerts, My Life mm -hmm. blog, which turned into a, a internet radio show, which was the F Money show, which I, I had a podcast for each of those, both not very good, but I had all <laughs> they, the friends underselling that. They were both very good. <laughs> just no one listened to no them. No one listened to them. But you know, I, I had a lot of great experiences over the years doing that. I recently just stopped doing it when we started this podcast, yeah, but I, yep. I was doing concert photography and, and writing music articles and meeting bands and interviewing bands backstage. I got to interview uh, bands like New Politics and, and meet Red Hot Chili Peppers and things like that. So it was – that's still a passion of mine, but – it, it's kind of taken over the years, taken a back seat to how mm -hmm. I feel about this. This is my priority, and I kind of stopped doing all the other things. So yeah, um, well, and one of the things that um, I do want to put this the right way, so yeah. I should probably think about how I'm going to say. It. Fran did mention how how family oriented our nursery is, yeah. and that's a uh, that's one of the things I always took for granted because, mm -hmm. like I said, I grew up here, and now uh, I live on an adjacent property and I get to go home and see my nine month old son mm -hmm. every day. And for lunch and um, like, I wake up with him every day. Like, so I get to spend so much time. I almost take it for granted. I don't, yeah. I was thinking about uh, 
if I had to commute, like I, my commute is literally three minutes. If I have like a half an hour commute, how much more time I would miss with my family and that how lucky I am for that. But uh, one of the things that really stands out in my mind about Fran and I, Fran and I is that um, we aren't what you think of when you think of like the, the uh, plant enthusiast, I guess. Yeah. I'd say. No, I would agree. Like Fran yeah. said, he's a sports fan. He's like, I wouldn't. I probably wouldn't put plant enthusiasts on like one of my top descriptive. Features, I, I wouldn't. Either, but we but are. I, we and are. We love nature yeah. and we love native plants, and uh, and that's one of the things I think has been hindering the native plant movement. Yeah. Especially when we've talked about before, and all these native plant groups, is people just get beat down. Native plants are for everyone. Yeah. They're for regular people who like watching the Eagles or, or the Yankees or Red yeah. Sox, whatever sports team they want, or enjoy having a beer and and spend time in their yard um it's not just for the people who are geeking out over plants yeah. and saying oh this is such a special plant and really just so enthralled with the plant it's got to be more of a way of, or of, i don't want to say a way no. of life but it needs to be a normal part of life it's, it's a lifestyle and yeah. i was going to say that's the difference like i love sports i love music a lot and 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 it's a hobby and i get to partake in those things mm-hmm. you know and i played sports and i i did all that stuff but ecology is a part of my every day yeah you know that i get to i get to be a part of like the other things i observe and maybe the music stuff i get to be a part of kind of on Mm -hmm. the fringe but this is something i'm entrenched in and it's anytime we're out i'm talking about native plants and pointing them out talking about the benefits and things like that or making choices that are better for Mm -hmm. for us as 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 part of the ecosystem so it's yeah. it's more of of who we are not yeah. just something yeah. we like to do and um and it should be part of in my opinion should be part of everyone's life and yeah. those choices should be easy it yeah. should be easy to go to the garden center and pick out hey this is going to be better for the environment yeah. and or the ecology um and unfortunately it's not and i think sometimes we do ourselves a disservice when we get so entrenched in the plants yeah. It should be easy. Hey, I want something that flowers and, and looks pretty. Well, here's a native plant that fits your need. Yeah, not, exactly. We shouldn't be boiled down in the minutia. Well, is it really, this is the perfect plant for, for your area? Or should yeah. you explore this? And that happens a little be- bit too Because often. it's our future. And, you know, we've talked about kids, yeah. you know, what's at times with, when I worked at the Connor Pyle company or Princeton nurseries, I was working 60, 70 hours a week and traveling three, mm-hmm. three months of the year, you know, and you yeah. think you yeah. start totaling that up with, you know, I missed my oldest son's first steps because I was at a management clinic in Kentucky, you mm-hmm. know, and that's not something I yeah. ever wanted to do again, you know, but and you make those choices and you you hope that they grow up with those choices mm-hmm. as well. And you, you you see that with your parents with with oh, the, yeah. you, you yeah. talked about what your vacations were, you know, as a kid mm-hmm. and what they involved in. And you're going to pass that on to your kids and it just yeah. becomes part of who you are, not just something you you like to do. I don't associate yeah. it with. Yeah, like you said, I don't. I don't really associate it with something I would describe myself as because mm-hmm. it's just part of who yeah. I am. You know? Yeah, and uh, I guess that was one of the reasons we started this podcast yeah. was to make it more approachable for for everything else. We looked at what else was out there. We wanted it to be mainstream. And um, yeah, it should be. It, it should, should be, be part of everyone's life, it and it should be something they don't think about. Yeah. Um, it's it's fine to be passionate about. It. I don't want to say that you shouldn't be passionate yeah. about native plants. Uh, it's important that there's people yeah. who are passionate yeah. about native plants, but it needs to be, we, it can't just be the early adopters that, yeah. that take us to the next it, step. It needs to be all inclusive. Yeah. Everyone needs to be, able, whatever yeah. your level of comfort is with being a part of it, you should have that option to be a part of it mm-hmm. at any level. So we didn't want it to be too stuffy or too technical. We wanted it to just be yeah. every day. I wanted my wife who's going to listen to this and, and, uh, and hopefully likes what I'm about to say. I wanted her who had, grew up in a, a development in a, a suburban part of new jersey mm-hmm. had no real experiences in my mind with nature or very very little yeah. with with nature i wanted her to be able to understand some of these more complex topics and approach be able to approach native plants and and feel like she knew a little bit when making those decisions yeah um oh i i see the difference and i know i've talked about my fiance mm-hmm. and how she grew up there's a a much larger difference in our connectivity with nature yeah she feels it on a much deeper level than i i do and it's just because of how it was part of her life growing up you know and that's something you can't you can grow but you Mm -hmm. can't just implant that in someone later in life (laughs) you know she just has it and i don't have and i 
I won't have it in the same way. Mm -hmm. It's more of an emotional connection that that she feels on a deeper yep. level than I ever will. So. so, well, with that, thank you again for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed listening to the buzz. Uh, thank you again for listening to Native Plants Healthy Planet. We know you there's a lot of choices for you to yes. to uh, dedicate your time even more every day. They keep popping up. <laughs> so we appreciate that you're choosing to spend some time listening with us. Yes, thank you. And and uh, as always, we're going to give a huge thank you to RJ Comer for our Buzz theme music, uh, which is part of its identity. Make sure you stream or buy RJ's music uh, on iTunes, Spotify, wherever you get your music. Hopefully when things open up and, and he could start performing live again, we can throw some show dates yeah. out for him and, and make sure you go see him if Ooh, you're in the area. Or we, have, uh, we can have the Native Plants Healthy Planet Festival. Tour or festival yeah i want our, that yeah. i want that i i really want that um i know egocentric plastic men who do our meet the guests theme music they would be down with that yeah. so um you can follow us on twitter at pineland nursery facebook at pinelands nursery nj instagram at pinelands nursery and youtube at pinelands nursery we have our question and comment line call us at 215-346-6189 like dr evil did uh, I'll repeat that again, 215-346-6189. Ask a question, leave a comment. If we pick your question or comment, we'll play it and answer it on a future episode of The Buzz. Um, and don't forget about our Native Plants Healthy Planet Facebook group. We're uh, like 315, 315 members, 316 members. We had a few mm -hmm. more today. So uh, the conversations have been great. Uh, keep being kind to each other and, and, and keep it going. Keep it on topic, and we'll keep the conversation going. Yeah. As always, you can listen to the Native Plants Healthy Planet podcast directly at www.nativeplantshealthyplanet.com. You can also check us out on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, really wherever you consume your podcast. When you're there, please subscribe. Please leave a review. And uh, and kind of what we just mentioned, yeah. share this with a friend. We want to spread this message. We want to make it approachable to everyone. Uh, we feel like this is a great introduction to, to the native plant world and, and why it's important. And um, if, if, if you let it, it will change your life. Yes, yeah. it's, it's a life changer. So and uh, and as always, if you do those things, it really helps us a lot. So with that, thank you, everyone. I'm Tom. I am Fran. Thanks again, everyone. We'll see you next time for our I don't even know what we don't have a confirmation for what next week is. No, yet. So no, it's, it's a surprise to us as well. <laughs> so, <laughs> But we'll be back again next week. Until then, keep it native. Thank you for listening to the Native Plants Healthy Planet Podcast, presented by Pinelands Nursery. Remember to like, share, follow, and comment.